Hey everyone, welcome back. In this video, we'll take a look at an open source CircuitPython gaming platform called the PewPew M4. This thing packs a SAM D51, so it's got an ARM Cortex M4 microcontroller, thus the M4 in the name. These chips have all kinds of cool features and pretty good performance for their size. They clock in at 120 megahertz and have plenty of power for running CircuitPython. If you've never heard of CircuitPython, it's a fork of MicroPython, which is an implementation of the Python programming language designed to run in low resource environments. So it doesn't need a big powerful laptop with a bunch of RAM or anything, it'll run just fine on tiny little devices like this. And while CircuitPython is what comes pre-installed on these boards, you can also program them using Arduino or any other embedded development platform that supports the SAM D51. It's also got a 160 by 128 color display, which I'll show how to write some Python code to draw and animate things on later in this video. And right here is a tiny little speaker. It's pretty quiet and there is no volume control, so don't expect to play MP3s from it or something. But if you're writing a game or program where you just want a bit of audio feedback, like a beep or a laser blaster sound, it gets the job done. You'll also notice this directional pad and three buttons right here, which you can use however you want in your Python programs. Over here on the back, you also have all of these GPIO breakout pins, and some of them can be used just as regular digital I.O. pins. Some of them have analog support, some of them have pulse width modulation support in case you wanted to control a servo or something. And some of them can be used for interfaces like SPI, I square C, and UART for connecting to just about any peripheral device you want. One thing I like about this pinout is that they're slightly offset, which gives them a really good grip on pin headers like this. So you see if I put this in, I don't even have to solder anything and it still has good contact. I've been using it like this to connect to a breadboard and interact with different peripherals, and it works pretty well. Because, yeah, while the design and intended purpose of this board is obviously to be used as a gaming platform, it's still a circuit Python development board, so you can program it to be anything you want. If you wanted to use this for home automation or as a remote control for something else, go for it. I think having the built-in buttons and screen really makes it useful for a lot of different projects. And finally, for power options, there's a battery holder for running it on two AAA batteries or a micro USB port, which can be used for power or programming. This little switch toggles between those two power sources, but if you're only supplying one source of power, like if you have batteries in but no USB cable, then it works like a power switch. I thought that was a pretty clever little design choice. Now, the board doesn't come pre-assembled, but it was really easy to put together. You basically just have to line everything up, put in a few screws, and then sticker the buttons in place. Now that we have the hardware out of the way, let's boot it up, Take a look at what the UI is like and what kinds of example programs it comes with. These are the four example programs that it came with at the time of recording this. The first one is your basic Space Invaders game. So if I click on it, the game starts to play. And this game has audio so you can hear the blaster and explosion sounds there. So yeah, this entire game is just a little Python script and you do have access to the source code, so you can learn from it or make changes to it. The next game that comes pre-installed is this jumper game. So this one looks like it was made by Adafruit because it uses a lot of their branding. And it's your standard platformer type game. You've got ladders, you've got platforms, you've got enemies roaming around that you can shoot with a little blaster. It doesn't do anything when you defeat all of the enemies, and there is no sound in this one, but again, all of the source code for this is on the file system, so you can go in and change it however you want. If you wanted to design your own level 2 and have it transition to that once you beat this one, you can do that. And if you wanted to add your own sound effects, that's pretty easy to do. The next game is this classic snake game, and I'm really bad at this one. But this one is built using a Python module called Pew, which makes developing games like this really simple. I'll show you some of the source code here in a bit, but you'll notice how everything looks like uniform blocks. 
That's because this Pew Pew M4 is an advanced version of a simpler game platform called Pew Pew, which only had LEDs instead of an actual screen. So that library was designed for lower resolution LED displays like this, but the same code still works on this higher resolution M4 platform. They've just drawn the LEDs as little blocks. The last pre-installed demo is Tetris, and it also uses that Pew library, which is why it looks so similar. So none of those are full-fledged games, they're all just little demos. But what's cool is that you have access to their source code so you can edit them or learn from them to make your own games. And since this is CircuitPython, you can view the code just by plugging the device in via the USB port. So when I plug it in, it mounts as a storage device named CircuitPy. Now I have access to all of the files. So first, let's take a look at main.py which is the menu script that loads when you boot it. The first thing you'll notice is that it's based on the CircuitPython micro game and stage modules. I won't go into too much depth about those here, but they're used to manage some of the lower level details of game development, like handling sprites and tile rendering. For instance, here it's using the tile system to draw the background border that you see on the menu screen. And down here, it's using the OS module to list all of the files in the main directory and only keep the files that are Python scripts unless they're the boot.py or main.py itself. And that's how the menu page automatically adds new scripts as options without you having to edit anything. This part here is the main loop for the menu, so it handles the navigation and selection and it returns whatever option is selected. And that gets used down here, which then imports the corresponding Python script executing the code. Now let's take a look at the snake.py script and see how it uses that pew module to draw blocks on the screen. First things first, it imports the pew module and then calls the init method to initialize everything and get it started. Next it creates a pixel buffer or a drawing surface using this pix type. And that's what will be used to store the state of the screen to represent which blocks on the screen are which color. And then almost right away, we see an example of how to do that with this pixel method. So this line of code will set the block located at this X and this Y to be a value of two. The color codes for the pew module are zero for empty, which is kind of like a dark blue, one for green, two for red, and three for yellow. I believe it's designed that way because the original Pew Pew boards used bicolor LEDs. So it's being set to two in this case because it's red. It's drawing where the first apple starts. The next important method is show, and it draws a pixel buffer to the actual screen. So changes you make to this pixel buffer aren't automatically visible. You have to call this show method to write them to the screen. And then the tick method handles timing. It's like a delay, but it compensates for the amount of time between calls and smooths out the frame rate. Basically, if you pass one divided by whatever frame rate you want and call this each loop, it should maintain the rate. Those are really the only methods you need to know for rendering with this module. Other than that, there's also this keys method, which returns a flag object representing the state of the keys. So you can test which keys are being pressed using the binary AND operator like this. And that's really all there is to it. Now, the pew library is really more of a learning tool, and it limits you to an 8x8 block display with only a few colors. If you really want to use this screen to its full potential, I'd recommend checking out the stage library that's used in the jumper demo. You can see that it takes a more object-oriented approach, where every sprite type is a subclass of the base sprite object, and they all have an update method that gets called every turn of the main game loop. This is a pretty common design in a lot of game engines, and the sprite tiles are all loaded from sprite sheets, which they call banks here. So yeah, this example is more complicated, but Adafruit has some good documentation and tutorials about these modules. Between those and this example, it's pretty easy to piece together what's happening and start building things on your own. But what I wanted was lower level access to individual pixels, and I found that in this display I.O. module. It lets you set up a display buffer and a palette of colors to use. 
And then you have to create a grid object and a display group and add it to the display. But then you can start drawing individual pixels. Since it's the 4th of July here in the US, I decided to make a little firework demo to show off the individual pixel access. So yeah, these are pretty interesting little devices. If you're looking to develop some handheld applications, especially if you're into Python, I would definitely recommend it. Anyway, thanks for watching. Uh, don't forget to check out the description for links to everything, and maybe click the like button while you're down there, and I will see you next time.